Hey, everybody, welcome to Red May, your one month vacation from capitalism, 43 events, 110 speakers, as Al Pacino would say, wow. Uh, maybe you'd like to know what's coming up because we have only five events left, I believe, five or six. Uh, and uh, so this is your last chance to get in some, uh, uh, some red into your life. Uh, because our whole thing is to riff on red. Anyway, uh, today, of course, is neither settler nor native. Uh, uh, tomorrow at uh, 11 a.m., we have Rethinking the Chinese Cultural Revolution with Alessandro Russo, Andrea Piazzoroli Longabardi, Chris Connery, and the Sad Hater. Uh, and at 5 p.m., Feminist International How to Change Everything. Uh, Veronica Gago, Michael Hart, and Kathy Weeks. On Monday, Marks for Cats, a radical bestiary. That is at 11 a.m. with uh, Lee Claire LaBerge and her cats. And uh, at uh, 6 p.m., Theory of the Gimmick, Aesthetic Judgment, and Capitalist Form, uh, a great new book by Sian Nagai. And uh, Christopher Nealon will talk to Sian about the book. So a lot of good stuff coming up. We're also rebroadcasting on Monday, neither vertical nor horizontal, uh, about Rodrigo Nunez's new book. And we have a Wednesday live event that's taking place somewhere in the Bay Area. Uh, so I'll clue you into those in, in the last days. How do we do all this? How do we make it work? Uh, what kind of institutional funding is there for a festival, one of whose slogans is be a commie for a month? Well, none. So we depend on the kindness of strangers like Blanche Dubois. Uh, you are the stranger whose kindness we depend on. So go to our website at www.redmayseattle.org. You'll find a button that says donate, and uh, you can do it either through our GoFundMe fan the flames of Red May, or you can do it with, uh, as a, pa a patron through Patreon. $3, $5, $10, or $20 a month. So many, many ways to help us out. We want to continue doing it. This is our fifth anniversary. It's pretty unbelievable that we've managed to make this go on fumes for the last five years. We want to do another five because we think we need a red think space uh, outside, of, uh, out, outside of the media. The, the mainstream media. So if you, if you like this space and enjoy coming into it, give. Enough of that. I won't be crass any longer. I want to move into a, a panel built around a, a really wonderful book called Neither Settler Nor Native by Mahmoud Mandani. Uh, and I can't think of anyone I'd rather have as a moderator for this uh, than an old friend from Seattle, uh, Ted Swedenberg, who uh, together with me in 1990 and a number of other people did the, the first big Arab film festival in the United States. Ted is professor of anthropology at the University of Arkansas and is the author of Memories of Revolt, the 1936 to 39 Rebellion and the Palestinian National Past. And he's co-editor of Displacement, Diaspora and Geographies of Identity in Palestine, Israel and the Politics of Popular Culture. I think that's two books there that I combined into one. Ted, welcome back in, oh, over, the, over the, the airwaves to Seattle in a way, or to invisible Seattle, we might call it. Yeah, thank you so much, Philip. And I hope to see you in Seattle someday soon, maybe at a Red May. Um, uh, thanks for uh, so much to uh, Red May and Philip to asking me, for asking me to um, moderate this session with these really amazing people um, and about this really amazing book. I'm gonna introduce them briefly um, and um, then uh, they will speak in the order of Mahmoud Bamdani, Roxanne Dunbar, Ortiz and uh, Samar Esmer. And I think we can just, um, I don't think I need to go in between y'all. So um, when Mahmoud is done then Roxanne can go and, and Samar can go. Um, Mahmoud uh, is the author of, of this amazing book that we're gonna be um, talking about. Um, and uh, he teaches at Columbia University and is author of several books. I think I read in an interview uh, with you uh, a couple of days ago that, that you're the author of 10 books. In, in the book jacket, uh, the books cited are Citizen and Subject, 
when victims become killers and good Muslim, bad uh, Muslim. Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz um, is a longtime writer and activist, um, author, I think most well known for her book, An Indigenous People's History of the United States, um, which um, informed Mahmoud's book and also the amazing uh, series on that is up on Netflix now, uh, Exterminate uh, All the Brutes. Um, and she just informed us while we were chatting before um, before we went online that she, she wrote another book during COVID, which is, I, I'm so impressed. Um, so another one coming. And Samara Esmer um, teaches uh, in the rhetoric department at University of California of Berkeley and is the author of Juridical Humanity, A Colonial History. Um, and working on another book and maybe you could tell us about that. I don't know, she's written a lot and you know, but I'm just kind of going with the main things here. Um, so I'll, uh, um, with that brief introduction, um, I'll turn it over to uh, Mahmoud. Each speaker is gonna speak around 10 minutes, although I'm not gonna be timing them. Um, and then there'll be ample time for discussion in the chat and with whoever is with us on, um, on, on Zoom and between the, between the uh, three or four of us as well. So take it away, Mahmoud. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you, Ted, thank you, Philip, thank you, Red May. I'd like to begin with a reflection on the experience of uh, two oppressed minorities in the US, American Indians and African Americans. Why are pre-Columbian communities in the US named Indians and not natives? What difference would it make if we renamed the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C. as the National Museum of the Native American? The short answer is that the native would be part of the political community we call the U.S. The Indian would not be. Why is it that the 1964 Civil Rights Act did not apply to Indians in reservations? but did to African-Americans and other minorities so that a separate Indian Civil Rights Act had to be passed in 1968. The two acts are not the same. The 1964 Act is constitutionally binding, whereas the 1968 Indian Act is only advisory. Reservation Indians are not and have never been rights-bearing citizens of the US in a constitutional sense. The reservation was a creation of the United States. The reservation is a separate polity, separate from the US. The Europeans who came to America were not immigrants, they were settlers. Whether they sought equality or advantage, immigrants came to join existing polities. Settlers come to displace existing polities and establish their own exclusive sovereignty. The Indian reservations are not part of the sovereign state we call the US. In the words of Chief Justice John Marshall writing in mid 19th century, reservations are quote, domestic dependent colonies. Politically, the term Indian tribal sovereignty masks colonial domination. Reservation Indians are legally wards of Congress. Reservation authorities are overseen by a vast federal bureaucracy known as the Bureau of Indian Affairs. It is no different from the colonial bureaucracy that governed any indirect rule colony in Africa. The Indian reservation was part of a two state solution, a sovereign state alongside a non-sovereign protectorate. The two state solution was Lincoln's contribution in the second half of the 19th century, Lincoln claimed to provide a permanent solution for Indians who had survived the genocide. America also originated the notion of differentiated citizenship with only some participating in sovereignty. Until 1921, Indians were nationals, but not citizens. After that, Indians had to be naturalized as citizens meaning they first had to be purged as members of Indian polities before they could become US citizens. 
Africans were enslaved individually and then governed in thousands of plantations. Indians were colonized as a people. Colonized Indians and African slaves represent two different strategies of domination with radically different consequences. Reservation Indians and African Americans do not have the same relationship to the US. Racial and colonial domination are not the same, even if racial discrimination is common to both. Economically, the American Indian symbolized stolen land. The African slave embodied stolen labor. Politically, Indians were governed in a protectorate as part of a two-state solution. African slaves were racially segregated within a one-state polity and governed in separate plantations. The one-state solution has provided a more suitable political frame for the development of the struggle against Jim Crow and racial domination. A multi-state solution, as in the Indian case, fragmented and isolated the colonized in reservations, which South Africans called Bantustans. Even if it proceeded by fits and starts, sometimes even receding, the one state framework has made possible the development of alliances. The two state solution explains the continued isolation and colonial subjugation of the reservation Indian. The colonial government's regime in North America was first exported to South Africa. South African settlers attained state independence in 1910. Over the next few years, settlers studied how Indians were governed in North America. Three key elements of the American model were imported to South Africa, homeland, traditional authority, and customary law. First was the presumption that every tribe must be territorially contained in a homeland. Second, that every homeland must be administered by a homeland authority, sanctioned as trans-historical and traditional, and thus not subject to being accountable. Finally, this traditional authority, it was presumed, must enforce a customary law on the homeland, also trans-historical and thus unchanging with one proviso, that custom be excised of all practices or notions that settlers considered repugnant to civilization. Invented in America, the two-state solution was exported to Germany. Whereas Hitler wanted to extinguish all minorities in Germany, post-Holocaust Germany looked for a two-state solution. Instead of reintegrating Jews into Germany, the post-Nazi German government, whether in the West or the East, supported a state exclusively for Jews outside Germany and outside Europe. The Israelis pushed for their own two-state solution, starting with the Nakba. The Nakba continues today. It is worth noting that South Africa is the place where apartheid tried but failed to press home a two-state solution. Are Jewish people in Israel settlers or immigrants? The Jewish population of Mandate Palestine, in my view, belong to three groups. Natives who never left Palestine, immigrants who returned on religious pilgrimages, and settlers, the last being the group that wanted to establish an exclusive Jewish state. Palestinians inside Israel cannot participate in sovereignty. They have rights, even political rights, including the right to vote, but they cannot participate in power. Israel is formally a Jewish state. There is in Israel-Palestine an ongoing debate on the merits of a one-state versus two-state solution. It calls on us to think through the difference between colonial and racial subjugation even where racism plagues both. In American terms, it is the alternative represented by the African slave and the colonized India. For a third alternative, we have to look at the South African transition from apartheid. I trace the turning point in anti-apartheid politics in South Africa to the 1970s. Anti-apartheid politics before 1970s reproduced the racialized architecture of apartheid. 
Each racial group organized separately as defined by apartheid power. Africans as African National Congress, Indians as Natal Indian Congress, coloreds as Colored People's Congress, and whites as Congress of Democrats. By reproducing the architecture of apartheid inside the resistance, resistance gave apartheid a natural flavor. The apartheid mindset was broken only in the 1970s. The key initiative came from the student movement, starting when black students led by Biko left the liberal white student organization, formed their own separate body and went on to organize township dwellers, starting with Soweto. Left in the wilderness, radical white students turned to organizing hostile workers on the fringes of townships. Out of this experience was born an epistemological awakening that white and black are political identities and that political identity is historical, not natural. Black, said Biko, is not a color. If you're oppressed, you're black. This was also the turning point in the Africana journey from being junior partners of British colonialism to becoming a part of the anti-apartheid coalition. Born in the 70s and 80s, the South African moment signified three epistemological shifts. From mobilizing opposition to apartheid, it went on to champion an alternative to apartheid. From calling for a state of the major majority, the national majority, the black majority, the nation, it went on to champion a state for all. Initially, not just all citizens, but all residents. From an opposition to whites, it went on to oppose white power. It depoliticized race and historicized the notion of majority and minority. 1994 led to the birth of a new political community. This outcome should be seen as an alternative to Nuremberg, which opened the gate to two purified nation states, a Germany without Jews and an Israel without Palestinians. I come to Palestinians. The Palestinian population is today fragmented into three, colonized citizens of Israel, residents of the occupied territories and refugees. Since 1948, each has been the source of a different political initiative. Refugees were the social base of the armed struggle. The first Intifada moved the social base of Palestinian resistance from refugees to Israel-Palestine. The second Intifada propelled Balad into calling for an inclusion of Palestinians in the political process, calling for a state of all citizens. After that came BDS. Anchored in the occupied territories, BDS calls for an external boycott, asking the world to divest from Israel. The anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa was not directed from a single center, but from multiple centers. Sometimes it included contradictory initiatives. Take the example of the anti-apartheid boycott, which was directed from outside the country and the internal political struggle which demanded reform of the political process to allow them to exercise the right to participate in that political process. Whereas the anti-apartheid boycott made no distinction between South African state and society, calling for a boycott of both, the internal political struggle proceeded by building alliances with all sectors of white society so long as they did not openly and actively support the apartheid state. The South African lesson is that we need to rethink the liberation project as political beyond moral. In Palestine, this means building on the gains of Balad and adopting a political strategy that will welcome anti-Zionist and non-Zionist Jews into the larger movement for a de-Zionization of the Israeli state. Rather than think of Balad and BDS as representing strategic alternatives, the South African lesson is to embrace both as standing for complementary strategies, external and internal. The lesson of the African-American struggle too is to build alliances within a single state so as to forestall the fragmentation, isolation and continued colonization as has happened to Indians in North America. 
Apartheid power was not defeated. Neither did apartheid win. The situation in the mid 1980s could only be described as a stalemate. Why then did apartheid power agree to negotiate in 1990? Two considerations made captains of apartheid rethink their primary reliance on a military strategy. One, the possibility that anti-apartheid mobilization may spread from the townships to Bantustans. But more important was the second possibility, one that signaled the likelihood of an even scarier outcome for apartheid. Boers realized that the hitherto pro-apartheid Boer intelligentsia was gradually beginning to abandon apartheid as a state project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mamu, for that. Um, I, um, I wanna talk about settler colonialism uh, in the United States, but of course it, um, um, it was, as Mahmoud uh, pointed out, the model for um, Palestine and South Africa apartheid. But it's important to know how it was almost like a scientific um, project in establishing settler colonialism. Uh, in the founding and development of the United States, settler colonialism was more than the continuation of a colonial structure that developed and replicated itself over time in the 170 years of British colonization in North America that preceded the founding of the United States. So the founders that constructed the United States um, in, in a constitution were not an oppressed colonized people as their origin narrative claims. The founding oligarchs were British citizens being restrained by their monarch from expanding the 13 colonies to enrich themselves. They were imperialists who visualized the conquest of the continent and achieving access to the Pacific and ultimately China. Achieving that goal required land and wealth and settler participation. They devised a unique plan manifest in the 1787 Northwest Land Ordinance created during the War of Independence by the Continental Congress that was reenacted as law at independence by the US Congress in 1789. Its provisions were borrowed in part from the British colonial system of settler colonialism in Ulster and Ireland and the 13 North American colonies. However, the founding of the US settler colonial state was something new under the sun. The constitutional construction of the fiscal military state with both ethnic cleansing of the native presence and chattel slavery producing racial capitalism the White Republic. The Northwest Ordinance provided for eventual settler self-government once European settlers outnumbered the indigenous population. The Land Act guaranteed to the settlers property guarantees, civil rights, religious freedom, trial by jury, representational legislation, and public education, a democratic order white democracy. That ultimate conclusion, however, was preceded by decades, a whole century to be total, of uh, successive stages of colonial development from military ethnic cleansing and control to a federally appointed territorial government to a semi-representational government to finally admission into the United States as a state equal to all other states. This constituted a unit of the fiscal military nation state. The founders were unapologetic imperialists following in the footsteps of the British empire 
but with the added conceit of an empire for liberty, as Thomas Jefferson conceived the future. Historian David Reynolds writes that Jefferson believed the US empire was destined to assume the responsibility to spread freedom around the world, starting with the North American continent and intervening abroad. US foreign policy was stamped with this concept and has provided the ideological motivation and rationalization for all US wars and interventions uh, ongoing. Throughout the Northwest Ordinance, the United uh, through the through the Northwest Ordinance, the United States created a unique land system among colonial powers, including Britain. <clears throat> In the U.S. system, land itself, not just what was produced on the land, agriculture, mining, logging, grazing, etc., but the land itself was the most important exchange commodity for the accumulation of capital and building the national treasury. In order to comprehend the apparently irrational genocidal policy of the US government toward the presence of native nations on the land, the centrality of land sales and building the economic base of the US capitalist system must be the frame of reference. Although private property and land had long been a fact in Europe and in other parts of the world, it was demarcated by the contour of streams, rivers, tree lines, rock formations, mountains, and private property was reserved for the economic and political elite. The architects of, US, uh, of the United States created something new the Platt system of privatizing land into marketable units. The Northwest Ordinance spawned the public land survey system, a unique surveying method to Platt, that is divide land, transforming it into property for sale and settling plots of 160 acres with sections of four plots or 640 acres. As the US took more land from the, from the Louisiana Purchase, the Oregon Territory, and half of Mexico, the government promised free land to Europeans and Euro-Americans for the purpose of recruiting and motivating settlers to squat on indigenous people's lands with indigenous resistance to the squatters. The army would be dispatched. The pieces of paper, the deeds representing units of land made up the commodity market that built the United States capitalist system and remains its central factor today. The other main commodity until 1865 was human, the enslaved African body with its deed of sale. Historian Donald Harmon Akinson aptly describes the implementation of the land ordinance. The importance of the of Northwest Ordinance was equal to that of the Constitution of 1787. The land ordinance did not deal with ethereal concepts such as pursuit of happiness, but instead declared in practical terms how the land from the Appalachian Mountains up to the Mississippi River was to be conquered. This was to be done by surveyors chains, each 22 yards in length. The measuring began at an arbitrary point in the Ohio Territory and invisible lines were drawn on the land to form a grid of perfect rectangles marked by herons, iron bars, and the occasional brass plate cemented onto a masonry base. Each of the rectangles had its own map reference. And as the US Imperium expanded, the grid eventually reached the Pacific Ocean and stretched between Mexico and British North America. The lines on the land not only conquered natural topography, but also made possible the liberation of parcels of land 
from their previous occupants, the native people, and their efficient allocation to newcoming settlers. This then was the implementation of the fiscal military state. The capitalist state made for war to in order to appropriate property. From the beginning of surveys in the newly claimed Northwest Territory to the Pacific Ocean, the lands claimed by the surveys were already populated with indigenous peoples, but the land was treated as terra nullis, unpopulated land. While the indigenous nations and communities reduced in numbers by genocidal warfare that caused displacement, starvation, crowded refugee situations, and resultant infectious diseases were forced onto army patrolled reservations dependent on government rations. By 1845, the indigenous peoples of the large native agricultural nations of the Southeast were forced, forcibly relocated to west of the Mississippi, allowing the development of the cotton kingdom that created the highest GDP of any country in the world by 1850. This is important not only for understanding how settler colonialism defines the United States and all its institutions today, but also as Mahmoud has documented, all of the defining institutions of settler colonialism as practiced in the 19th, 20th and 21st centuries were first developed in North America. The US tribal homeland was the prototype not only for the South African Reserve, but also the Nazi concentration camp. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Red May. Thank you for the invitation. And it's, it's an honor and privilege to be here in conversation with you, Mahmoud and Rizam. Um, there is much to admire about this book that Mahmoud Mamdani has offered us. Um, I cannot do everything justice, but I will hide a few arguments that I find quite compelling and then articulate some alternative understandings, especially in relation to Palestine, given in the short time that we have. There is first and foremost the animating question and political concern that Mahmoud presents us with. What are our possible political futures once we've recognized and fully come to terms with the ongoing past of the catastrophe of settler colonialism, civil war, and other forms of extermination? What futures can be imagined and pursued? And I'd say he's also suggesting prefigured. Um, what futures can be prefigured then that do not replicate colonial categories and technologies of rule, including those that rest on the creation of political difference. In other words, he says how to decolonize the political. And is there a more interconnected story to be told about the pasts and the presence of conquest and extermination? A story that connects the US with Nazi Germany, with the Sudan, with South Africa and Palestine, and what lessons for the future can this interconnected story leave us with? In its different chapters, the book proceeds precisely on these two fronts, diagnosing the, diagnosing the past of conquest and extermination in their different forms, as this past lingers into the present in current categories of governance and offering a normative suggesting of a possible, another possible political future. And while I'm personally not convinced that our political futures should necessarily be of a similar form, a state of all of its citizens, or even the limiting of political action to an a priori commitment to the state form, I'm drawn to the attempt to think the question from the grounds of past present and to grapple with its complexity, for this is one of the key political questions of our times. And this book presents us with journey into possible answers for this question. 
Which brings me to another remarkable aspect of this book, the connections made between seemingly discrete parts of the world, from the US to Nazi Germany and its aftermath, to the Sudan to South Africa to Palestine, and the ways in which connective threads are pursued from one place to another without collapsing all sites in one story. So we learn, for example, um, of the connections between reserves in South Africa and reservations in the US, themselves then presented as a milder version, quote, of the Nazi industrial concentration camp, end quote. So many other devices are used are deployed to establish connections, including, of course, the device of colonial indirect rule, which Mahmoud has written about in his other books, through which native authorities um, from tribal authorities all the way to the Palestinian authorities in the 1967 occupied part of Palestine, control and rule. And there is, of course, the question of violence, one that Mahmoud has written about in, other, in his other works. And here, the analysis of both the Nazification, denazification, and the South African TRC are quite compelling. By focusing, he's arguing, Mahmoud argues, by focusing our efforts on the criminalization of political violence, uh, we end up focusing on individual actors, change of responsibility, individual accountability. Criminalizing violence does not, does not attend to the more structural and indeed lawmaking capacities of political violence. Therefore, to oppose this violence, something else other than criminalization ought to take place. And that something else we're told is the making of possible, making possible of another political community, another legal regime, one that proceeds by decolonizing the first political order, not merely by criminalizing some of its aspects and therefore by maintaining it. For if the modern state is based on conquest, not tolerance, a conquest that is accomplished not only by military occupation, but also by genocide and ethnic cleansing and displacement, then contending with these foundational moments of the state form becomes an urgent task. This is impossible to politically accomplish, we're told, by human rights or international criminal law. I'd add a personal footnote here that it is no wonder that the main political action of the Palestinian Authority today in the West Bank, the native authority in Mahmoud's words, has been to hold Israel accountable for its crimes in the International Criminal Court. It is one ultimately, this action is one ultimately that perhaps holds Israel accountable but does not challenge the foundations of the state, the violence that engendered the state. I'd like now to just offer some alternative possible questions and alternative possible readings of the, of, 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 the, of the question of Palestine. Like Mahmoud, I'm committed to thinking politics in ways that do not reproduce colonial technologies of rule. But I'm left unconvinced as to why the category of the citizen survivor is one that does not reproduce permanent identities. I'll say more about the figure of the survivor in a bit, but for now, perhaps, we can recall that citizenship as a matter of history, not of liberal theory, is always hierarchical and that the citizenship of Palestinians in Israel has always been a technology of colonial rule. Its condition, its condition of possibility was the conquest of 1948. Palestinians inside Israel were, were governed as citizens, as citizens. It is their citizenship that secured their minoritization. And I repeat, it is their citizenship that secured their minoritization. Israeli scholars who write about this get it sometimes upside down, if you will. They begin from the condition of minority and then they critique the second class citizenship status of that minority. In so doing, they rarely question how citizenship, the status itself, dismembered Palestinian citizens from the rest of the Palestinian body, thereby making them a minority. That is why the project of the state of all of its citizens, in which I personally participated as a founding member already as a university student, and then as a lawyer, that is why this project is not working for the current generation of Palestinians, 
one that has learned to question its minoritization, its dismemberment, and wants to care for other members of the people. Of course, all Palestinians, as Mahmoud points out and explains at length, are dismembered. Um, we have a fragmentation of territory and of legal status. And it is this dismemberment we must recall that was the target of the recent uprising in Palestine that is going to continue. It is an uprising that aims to regather and to re-collectivize the people and the people, not the nation. If we are looking then to undo technologies of colonial rule, we would also want to focus on how the minoritized Palestinian population inside Israel regathers itself with other parts of the Palestinian people in defiance of colonial legal categories of rule. This is an urgent task, and I will add here that it is in this sense that BDS is a political, not a moral campaign, despite its language of human rights and international law. One of its key political accomplishments, with, which is oftentimes neglected, is the undoing of the colonial strategy of fragmentation. We cannot understand BDS based on the text alone. We must understand the kind of political mobilization it has engendered. It has engendered the undoing of colonial division and minoritization. It is therefore not solely external. The citizen, even as it addresses the world. My other question relates to the category of the citizen as survivor. There is an argument that the future of political community is a community of citizen survivors. And here I just want to, you know, there is this text that circulated, a sentence that circulated by a, by a Gazan artist, a 20 year old Gazan artist in the last week. And she writes, Malak, her name, Matar, she writes, nobody survives wars. This is a myth. You never really survive the trauma of it, end quote. So my question is, if the survivor, the survival of the conquered, the evacuated, is itself a question category, how do we think the future absent the category of survival? What else could unite the citizens to come? Might we suggest that it's struggle, not survival? It is struggle that is at the that prefigures the future to come. And so much of this is evident in the chapter on South Africa. This means that the perpetrator has to join in the struggle and not survive it in its aftermath. My other concern with the category of survival is the fact that those who have undergone conquest and are and ongoing attempts of evacuation are not only victims as opposed to perpetrators, but are also activists and fighters. And we have to accept this fact, can we reduce the anti-colonial or can we classify the anti-colonial activist or figure as a survivor? We will have to say, what, will we, what is she surviving? Is she surviving her own political agency and resistance? In other words, if we accept that catastrophe, extermination, and conquest do not only produce victims and perpetrators, but also resistant political subjects, shouldn't our view of the future political community not be limited to the figure of survival? Hence my insistence on active present struggle, not future survival, as the key figure of um, a decolon or a key figure in activity of a decolonized political community. Which brings me to my last point about struggle. There is a line in the chapter on South Africa that I found most compelling. Mahmoud writes, by the mid 1980s, the townships have become ungovernable. The insurrection involved a loosely organized coalition of community and work-based organizations with the United Democratic Front at the helm. To become ungovernable, is the part I appreciated. And I believe that we are witnessing the seeds of something similar in Palestine's today, from the general strike of last week to forming neighborhood and town committees to protect the neighborhoods to local economic boycotts underway, local economic boycotts underway. 
the struggle, of course, revives earlier struggles and makes for an for the beginning of an ungovernable community. This much, I believe, as it, and I participated with Balad, Balad failed to imagine because it restricted itself to the vision of a future political community of citizenship to come, and therefore limited its present at, at the time and today political action to the politics of citizenship, not to the politics of ungovernability. Thank you. Thanks to all three of you. Um, and I, I wondered, Mahmoud, did you want to uh, uh, respond to um, the presentations and uh, the questions that were posed to you um, before we go on to other questions? <laughs> Can't hear you. Hey, you can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I would I would love to uh, uh, not respond to it, but but engage with uh, uh, with 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 both uh, my colleagues, um, and especially with uh, with with Samir. Um, so there are two questions which uh, which. Uh, I find particularly compelling. Uh, I'll take them in reverse order. Uh, one is the question of the citizen survivor. Now, I never use the term citizen survivor. Uh, actually, citizen, citizen survivor is a contradictory combination. Uh, the survivor uh, may not be limited to the citizen. The ANC in its uh, Freedom Charter 1955 uh, had a very compelling um, call for action, which said, South Africa belongs to all those who live in it. Not South Africa belongs to its citizens to all those who live in it. The survivor to me points to all those who live in it. The citizen, and I agree with Samir completely, uh, the citizen has the possibility of building another set of uh, communities uh, which are based not only on difference, but also on hierarchy. As we see, I mean, it, it's so obvious today uh, in, the, in, the, in the politics of, of the citizen and the immigrant. Uh, so obvious uh, in the Trump era that we've just come through. But back to South Africa, because I think it'll allow me to make, a, make an important point. In 1994 in South Africa, uh, there was a The big issue when the elections came, 1994 elections, was who would have the right to vote? There were two positions. One was only citizens, only, mark that word. The second position was everybody who lives in South Africa. The difference was huge. Uh, it was by millions of people because South Africa had millions and millions of immigrants who had come from across the borders who were working inside South Africa. These immigrants were the political activists that Samir is talking about, the front line of the political activists who had created the trade unions in the early 1970s, first Fosatu and then Kosatu. That position won out. Everybody who lived in South Africa was, was allowed to vote. But it was not durable. The Inkata Freedom Party got control of the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Gatsha Butelezi became the Minister of Internal Affairs. And uh, over time, they began to propagate the notion that the immigrant 
lived at the expense of the citizens and began a set of not laws, but regulations, rules and regulations, which began to disenfranchise the immigrant. That was the beginning of what is known as xenophobic violence in South Africa. It's very interesting that in South Africa, xenophobic violence is not against the racial stranger. It's against the tribal stranger. It points us to both what has been achieved and what has not been achieved in South Africa. What has been achieved to a limited extent is the deracialized, the depoliticization of race. What has not been achieved is the depoliticization of tribe. Now, to come to Palestine, again, I'm in agreement uh, that, that I, think, I think of both Balad and BDS. As, as having a very important contribution to make and at the same time having a limitation if it is seen as an alternative on its own. Certainly, Balad expanded our vision by talking of Israel as a state of all its citizens. And yet Balad's vision was limited to the territorial boundaries of Israel. Herein lies exactly what Samir has been, has been talking about. With BDS, um, I agree again, of course, BDS is not simply a moral campaign. There's a politics to the moral campaign. And for me, what is, what is crucial and critical uh, the, the, the critical lesson from South Africa is the building of alliances inside Israel. The kind of alliances that we see in the US today with the Black Lives Matter movement. Blacks are a minority in the US, 15%, 17%, whatever is the figure. But the black minority is at the forefront of building alliances that is creating a new kind of a majority. So the majority is not simply a statistical majority based on census. The majority is a political majority. It is that majority that has to be created through what, what African-American theorists call intersectionality. Um, but we may use whatever language we want to use. I think I'll stop there. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm probably taking too long. Okay. Um, I had a couple questions um, and uh, hopefully then we'll get some from our uh, uh, viewers as well. I haven't seen any uh, come in yet. Um, like Samra, I was... Um, I was very taken and much appreciated the the discussion of South Africa and the the the, the proposal that um, the historical case of South Africa and its struggle could be a kind of possible model, if somewhat flawed, for decolonization um, and decolonization in particular um, the cases that that I know the best about, um, mostly Pal Palestine Israel, but also I mean much less, but you know the the U.S. case, but. Um, what occurred to me, um, although I got hopeful from the, from the from the model, was the the differences between South Africa and the U.S. and Israel Palestine. I mean, the, the um, I didn't look up the figures, and I don't have them in my uh, uh, right at hand. But the vast majority of the population of South Africa were non-white. That is to say, the whites, the dominant population, was vastly outnumbered um, in terms of population. Also, the, 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 the historical conjuncture was one in which the strategic um, position or importance of South Africa was, uh, was not as important with the end of the Cold War. And I don't think the strategic position of South Africa has ever been um, as important to the United States as, uh, or, or to the Western world as, as, as uh, Israel is. Um, Native American population, Roxanne, of course, could correct me, but I, mean, I don't think it's more than 2% of the population. Um, in, you know, in the most powerful country um, in the world. In Israel-Palestine, it's 50-50. And again, we're talking about, 
you know, a country that has nuclear weapons and has the backing of the, of the most powerful country in the world. Um, and you also don't have the, it, in either case, obviously the dependence on labor um, in, in Israel, you know, a Palestinian labor or, you know, Indian labor in the US that you had in South Africa. So um, cheer me up. <laughs> it's, it, it, you know, it's, you know, what, how, how, you know, what are, what are the possibilities? I mean, can, you know, can, can this be done in the US and, and, and Palestine? I think we're all really invested in, in this happening. Um, is, is, is there something, um, is there something other than this population imbalance that I seem to maybe be gooding, uh, be, be giving so much weight to? So go ahead, Roxanne. Go ahead, Roxanne. There I go. That's a very good setup <laughs> for, um, for uh, depression. But um, <clears throat> in the United States, um, I, there's, there's this huge problem of uh, winner take all politics, uh, electoral politics. And um, that basically excludes native people, um, except in some, you know, very special circumstances uh, could have won the last election by tipping Arizona uh, with a great, uh, huge Navajo vote. And in South Dakota, sometimes it, it, it makes a difference and sometimes in uh, Minnesota, where there's a large um, Anishinaabe population. So, but the point is that native people still control a great deal of land in the United States, far outnumbering, you know, uh, more than, you know, the percentage of population. And um, it's very strategic land in some ways. Um, but more than that, the so-called federal land, which is like three fourths of the land west of the Mississippi is federally uh, owned in various um, departments, forestry, park system, Bureau of Land Management, Army Corps of Engineers, a uh, dozen that now a Native American is in charge of in, in the, uh, in the, um, um, in the, um, uh, Department of Interior, Dib Holland. Um, but all of this land is kept in federal hand. There, there's this constant uh, call of ranchers um, and industry in the West to privatize federal land. They've been trying to figure out how to do it. But they're in the, what I call the jockstrap of their own laws, the United States, because they don't own it. This is all land that was taken without treaties. So they actually, it, it belongs, it still belongs to the specific native peoples. And uh, they know that, they don't ever tell the public that. <laughs> we don't really own this land, therefore we cannot transfer it to <clears throat> the Bundy brothers and other um, predatory cattle, uh, very wealthy cattle ranchers. So that native people know that <clears throat> they know they they own that land, and um, <clears throat> recently there was a in the Atlantic magazine. I don't know if you saw it, David, who's Anishinaabe from Minnesota, um, wrote an argument for um, uh, reverting the national parks. Uh, these are the most sacred sites of native people, Yosemite, um, Yellowstone, Grand Canyon, uh, the Black Hills, of course, that were taken illegally. Um, so he makes a case, I, I, I think everyone should read it. It's a, it's a really a, um, uh, a, um, a case that I think could be sold to the public um, who might not care at all, you know, who are the stewards of the national park system? 
um, the park rangers or or could it be the native people um, so that you know land back that is the that is the single motto right now of the native movement in the united states and as uh, someone pointed out the um uh, black lives matter uh you did i think uh, multiplying it's you know more than its numbers having this influence of building um, building coalitions one of the coalitions that they're associated with is the Red Nation, uh, an organization based in Albuquerque that is openly a Marxist-Leninist um, um, organization, non-attached to any of the of the so-called parties uh, that exist. An independent um, initiative based and you know really really grassroots based. Um, Nick Estes has become quite an important leader in that respect, having been a co-founder of it. Uh, but Red Nation has a huge um, effect. They also have ties with uh, Palestinian issues. And Nick has gone many times to Lebanon for meetings. Um, and so there is this, you know, this, um, I, I, I think it's really important to understand uh, the political uh, nature of, uh, of the power rather than simply the numbers involved. Um, so that's uh, especially in the face of uh, historical genocide that uh, uh, punishing people who were, um, who experienced genocide by saying, well, you're too few people. <laughs> sort of um, gets into a uh, continued genocide mentality. Um, so that, you know, that I think is, um, is something, you know, that's, that's called decolonization and that's a process that's very dynamic right now. And I have a lot more hope, I think, than a lot of, a lot of my colleagues and comrades um, who aren't involved in, or don't know much about the native movement because um, I do know, and I do know, I, I made the decision in 1974 <clears throat> that that would be my major uh, attempt, you know, contribution or uh, is to help build, um, build that movement. Because for me, I do not believe we can ever begin to change the United States from a white Christian nationalist republic. Um, with a very strong base of descendants of the original settlers with 75 million votes in the last election without the consciousness of uh, and the knowledge of U.S. history. And that is fundamentally uh, um, a Native American story that is known basically only to Native Americans and to the extent that they can teach it or spread it. Um, so that, that I think is actually the most important thing we need to look at in the United States for any future change is a reconfiguring of the topography, literally, where land is transferred. And I know, you know, European um, socialism and strategies and all have really never worked in the united states and yet they you know we keep plugging away you know the working class the working class but in a settler state the the white working the you know the working class has a very different configuration than in uh, uh let's say china or almost any anywhere else even in europe uh, even though they were colonizers, you know, internally, um, their labor movements. So we have to get out of the Eurocentric uh, approach to making change in the United States. Samar or Mahmoud want to say anything or we can go on to another question. <laughs> Mahmoud, go first, if you want. You're muted. Mm. Yeah. 
Look, um, the question you asked, is there something other than population? Uh, in South Africa, uh, the non-whites until Biko welded them into blacks um, were the majority. In Palestine, Israel, Palestine, it's half, half. Um, in the US, American Indians are 2%. Um, yes, there's something other than population. And that something other is politics. In my view, majorities and minorities are not statistical. They are political. They are historically made and they are historically unmade. So part of the politics of liberation is precisely creating majorities, political majorities. And part of the politics of governance, colonial governance is dividing and fragmenting majorities into tiny minorities. That is the contest. Okay, and that's a political contest. It's not statistically given from the time we are born so that we, uh, we, 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 we are just resigned. Um, look, Palestinians in Israel, for example, okay, look at Israeli governance. It divides the Arab from the Bedouin from those in the Golan Heights, okay? Constantly, constantly fragmenting, constantly uh, 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 creating uh, um, chipping away, chipping away as much as much as possible. Um, of course, these places are not the same. South Africa is not the same as the US is not the same as as, as Israel Palestine, and they cannot be the same. Uh, I'm 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 not talking of sameness. I am talking of uh, drawing lessons, and 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 the key lesson is is a political lesson. The strategic position of South Africa changed. Strate South Africa was very important strategically before when, when the Cold War was going on. Uh, so the US saw South Africa as, 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 as the front line uh, against, against uh, uh, armed struggle in Angola, in Mozambique, in, in, uh, uh, in Zimbabwe, in Namibia, in, you know, um, so South Africa was very much, and, and, and they tried as much as possible to create the alliance, South Africa-Israel alliance. Israel is today very strategic for the US, um, but it may not necessarily remain the same. It will demand, depend a lot in what happens inside Israel-Palestine and what happens inside the US. The day, the day, the, the the day the powers that be in Israel, Palestine, and the US reached the same con this conclusion they reached in South Africa, which is that this struggle is not winnable militarily. That day they will have to look for a political solution and we will have turned a corner. That's my point. I'll, I'll just say a few words, uh, Ted. Thank you, Mahmoud, and thank you, Roxanne. First is, I mean, I actually think the, the BLM, the Black Lives Matter model is, is quite difficult to translate to Palestine, precisely for the reasons you say, Mahmoud, in your book, which is, this is not a question of settler colonialism. And the practices of overcoming it are, are different and have different sort of spaces to evolve from. Um, and, but that is not to say that there were no, no such practices in the past among Palestinians. In fact, what we do have is a long history of colonially engineered coexistence. I personally participated as a kid in many such meetings in which I was tasked with, <laughs> I and others were tasked with appealing to Israelis and showing them that we're not a threat and that there could, there could be a future. And these were required meetings in elementary school, in middle school, in high school, where we were required to meet with Israeli Jewish students in order to 
fabricate this colonial coexistence. Of course, that's not what you have in mind. Obviously, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that there is that history as well of appealing. And that history of constant appealing for recognition and inclusion and belonging and creating something has also gone changed from that appealing from a condition of weakness, right? Appealing for recognition to the state of all with citizens argument that did something else, right? Attempted something else, but still was bounded to the category of the citizen as you clarified and explained now and territorially and therefore bounded to minoritization. Um, but then they're, they're bounded to a condition of bound to a condition of weakness, right? Because you're a minority, you're speaking from that condition. Even that did not gain much traction. And so I think that the, the and and that of course did not help the rest of the Palestinians either. Because if you remember, how did this come about? This came about when the two-state solution was being sort of actualized. And then Palestinians said, well, what inside Israel? What about us? Where will that leave us? And so it actually came from a condition, you know, the condition of possibility of this project was the two-state solution. And so I think today, I am just finding it incredibly difficult to imagine a phase in a political struggle, wherever it is, not only in Palestine, even in South Africa, be, and, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, or even in the US where it is possible to begin to articulate a future from conditions of total weakness and fragmentation. That is, it is it possible to appeal to the other for, with a future from conditions of total fragmentation. Uh, and those, and, this, and by fragmentation, I don't mean any sort of blood or, you know, I do mean political fragmentation and therefore an absence of a political community that, that gathers people. Um, I, I just don't see it because the historical examples of how Palestinians have done that did not work out. And one has to then answer the question, why? It didn't work out. What was missing so that it didn't work out? That would be my, I mean, it's a question. I'm not, of course, I mean, I may be wrong, but that would be my reading of that history. Samir, I think you're right. Um, you, you, you are right in the sense that obviously there is no way you can turn to appealing to the other from a position of weakness. You can't shake hands with, with your knees on the ground. Uh, look, I, I return to South Africa. Sharpville, 1964. The liberation movements go outside of South Africa. They say we're going to turn to armed struggle, but there was no armed struggle. The armed struggle was rhetorical. A few bombs, that's about it. What happened inside South Africa? Inside South Africa, it was the silence of a graveyard. The political activists who defended the communities were drained. They went out to get training as, 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 as guerrillas. The situation changed in the 1970s inside South Africa. Those who remained inside were accused by those, by the liberation movements who were on the outside of having compromised, of having uh, 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 given in to the enemy. But when the turning point came, it is those inside who mobilized communities. And what took South Africa to 1994 is first and foremost, the internal mobilization. And only then, the external mobilization. I don't want to pit them against one another, but I do want to put the accent where I think it should belong. So I agree with you. Look, I'm not offering a liberal utopia of, of, of come on, let's hug one another. And, 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 and you know, you recognize me, I recognize you. Uh, 
no, no, that's nonsense. I, 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 don't, I don't, I don't, I mean, not for a minute. Uh, no, no, that's good. We have a couple uh, questions from uh, the audience. Um, the first one is directed to uh, Roxanne, but um, anyone else wants to uh, chime in, that would be great. Um, and the question is, I am, orga I am organizing, Native American, organizing a Native American workshop at the Pittsburgh DSA. I would like to know how a few settlers, I love thinking of us as settlers, um, uh, how, how a few settlers can assist the people in their struggles. You're muted, Roxanne. Pittsburgh is an interesting place to um, organize. Um, I would say I, I, you know, I've been back there a couple of times. I, I, I really um, would like to spend more time there researching, but I hope people will think about um, studying uh, what happened in that part of, uh, of the world during the colonial period and um, on in the U.S. period. It was a, it is a central place for the organization of the um, uh, the insistence on going into Indian country, what had been declared Indian country in the Treaty of Paris after the French and India, or the, the uh, Seven Years' War between France and, and Britain. And Britain drew a proclamation line. It was, it was a part of an agreement of the, uh, they won, the British won, part of the agreement of um, uh, the Treaty of Paris was that um, Britain would stay on the eastern side of the Appalachians and Alleghenies and not go for more property. It would be Indian and, and it would no longer be French territory. It was Indian country. That was the technical title for it. And how those, Pittsburgh was a, a real center of um, the organizing to defy that proclamation of 1763 that prohibited uh, British settlers from going over and um, redcoats were brought, uh, regiments of redcoats were brought to go in and force those who had gone in illegally, even if they had built um, fortresses and farms to force them back it, and this is why the United States declared independence. Everything in the declaration is about that. You know, the complaining about billeting the redcoats, uh, the Stamp Act, which was imposed to pay uh, for this process of um, there. It was already illegal to go over, you know, but with the uh, Treaty of Paris, it was, um, it had to be enforced. So Pittsburgh is a center of rebellion by settlers against, um, against uh, that prohibition. And um, one of the funnel points of continued, uh, continued illegal settling, settling uh, in, uh, in Appalachia. So I would say one, you know, the most important thing to do wherever people are in the United States and trying to organize some kind of solidarity with Native people is to learn your own history because every inch of the United States was populated by Native people when the British and the Spanish and the French came. And you're walking on Indian bodies, burial grounds, um, in every inch of the United States. So that, you know, that history, it's, um, the US tries to be completely, you know, um, blind to history because it is the only thing that can free this country, uh, free the people of this country 
to change. And that means the world, since the US has 8,800 8, bases around the world and controls so much, um, that, that that true history be exposed. And in every place, I know that people do these, um, these uh, ritualistic kinds of uh, uh, recognitions of where they are, what native land they're on, but, and they've obviously done a lot, you know, some research to, um, uh, to understand that. So take it further, you know, and find out where the burial grounds are and how to help the Native American, particular Native American people to reclaim the bones and, and um, items of their ancestors. Um, there is a, um, uh, a legislation that calls for, you know, the uh, return of all native items. Um, it's up to the tribes to initiate it, but they have very few resources. So each part of the country could, you know, people can form uh, form a, a unit, you know, to investigate and find out and, and make those uh, uh, bones and body parts um, be restituted to, um, uh, to the people they belong to. I would like to chime in here um, as uh, I, I, I'm so happy that the person <laughs> said that we are settlers. That's, I think that's like, we just need to think of ourselves as settlers, not Roxanne, but you know, the rest of us as, as participating in this thing. Um, I, I, I'm a settler. I mean, okay. my family is Scots-Irish, the worst of the settlers. <laughs> okay, sorry, uh, or not sorry, but uh, um, and I, I just wanna say, I, I live at the bottom of, of Mount Sequoia. Um, I lived here for about 23 years before I knew who Sequoia was. Um, but fortunately, I, uh, um, and I know, I've studied, because I know a lot about um, destroyed, the 480 or whatever it is, destroyed villages in Palestine, um, and, and, uh, and very ignorant, or have been very ignorant about um, local history. Luckily, I'm friends with um, the head of uh, our uh, Indigenous Studies program, who's Cherokee, who's enlightened me a lot, and I learned that a Cherokee was murdered in Fayetteville, Arkansas on the town square in the course of the Trail of Tears. I'm also made or became friends with um, someone who's a descendant of Geronimo and Cochise, who's a Fort Sill um, Apache. And if you wanna, if you want a horrifying, you know, another horrifying story of genocide, just go read about the Fort Sill Apache. They just about eliminated them. And uh, they lived as prisoners of war, I think, until 1910, something like that. So um, get some, you know, <laughs> to the person in DSA, get some people to tell you these stories. You, your, your whole perspective on where you live, I think, will uh, change um, dramatically. Um, uh, another question, um, and I'm going to expand on it a little bit. The question is, is Hamas an organization that helps or hurts Palestinians? And I think, I think, I mean, um, Mahmoud writes a lot about, um, and I found this quite illuminating, and we, it was discussed a little bit, you know, the question of, of armed struggle and so on. And I think, you know, I'm sure the question is, is um, or, you know, I'm imagining the question, I, I guess I should say, is motivated by the, you know, issue of, you know, Hamas is rocketing Israel. Is that, you know, helping or hurting? So um, whoever wants to go with that one. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> no, I saw that Mahmoud is unmuted, so I, yeah. Uh... I, look, I, I am happy to answer this, but maybe I'll go after Samir, if you uh, want to say something. I, yeah, I, uh, I mean, you know, historically, Palestinians have that, had various iterations of armed struggle. Hamas is not the only iteration of armed struggle, and we must remember that, right? And armed struggle also, I mean, in the second Intifada, it was, um, it was in part armed, right? And it was um, the harbor for the armed struggle or the, the, the sort of 
the person who supported this armed guard server was Yasser Arafat in a very sort of, uh, in, I think Mahmoud even writes about this in, in, in the book of that moment in which we, um, there is, Arafat is playing that double game of on the one hand negotiating and on the other hand, um, supporting the second intifada, which was in part armed. So this overemphasis on Hamas as the only carrier of armed struggle, first, I'd, I'd like to be careful about it because it care it's especially because it's an Islamist movement and therefore it assumes it associates armed struggle violence with an Islamist group. So and so in, in the West Bank as well, there were many operations in the second and the father that were carried out by non-Hamas, non-Islamic jihad groups. Now the question of whether this is effective or not, that's a different question of the role of armed struggle in um, in the Palestine question. I do not think that you can actually engineer a complete elimination of armed struggle from Palestinian anti-colonial um, anti -colonial struggle. It will be almost impossible to do that. But what you can, but what is important to note out, at least in this, and, and we can look at this very last moment, these past few weeks, that it was actually not the most necessarily the, the most central mechanism of resistance during this pa these past few weeks. That the for even though these have been absent, we have witnessed the regathering of the Palestinian popular struggle next to that armed struggle. And that those go went hand in hand. In Gaza, it is difficult to see what kind of communication can emerge from Gaza to Israel that is not in the form of rockets. So it is really impossible to see. There was another communication and we can look at it. 2018, 2019, the March of Return. Uh, a March that lasted for more than a half, uh, a half any, um, 18 months or so, I believe, started in December 2018 and continued into 2019. Um, and, and that March, which was a peaceful protest, also resulted in the bombardment and around 400 people were killed during the bombardment of that peaceful protest from Gaza. So these were the two really attempts in, in, the, in recent years of communicating resistance coming from Gaza. And one must understand that, I mean, it's not necessarily strategic, but it's, there is something that has, in whatever form it is, that has to carry resistance, again, in its different forms, because otherwise what is achieved is pacification. And so what is achieved, what is achieved is complete, you know, agreement to the terms of the siege. And during this time, until the siege is lift, is, is, it's lifted. That resistance, that political resistance is necessary. Is necessary not in order necessarily to only to lift the siege, but in also to make life livable. That is to live and not to agree to conditions of total pacification and imprisonment. In this sense, I, I, one has to understand practices of resistance not only in sort of strategically as to how they defeat the enemy at a certain point, but also as strategies that maintain political resistance and therefore life of dignity, of some sort of dignity where one feels that one is doing something. And again, therefore, we cannot understand armed struggle in the abstract, but we must understand its different functions and sometimes they're competing. Sometimes they're not the same, but we must offer that analysis of the different operations and logics and grammars and the targets and the ends and the objectives of each formation of resistance. So again, I would not think only in terms of Hamas, I would want to just separate the question of armed struggle from the question of Hamas. And maybe one last thing that actually 
international law is also to blame for modeling anti-colonial revolution on the logic of armed conflict from the Geneva Conventions of 1977, in which national liberation movements demanded that their anti-colonial revolutions be recognized as international armed conflicts parallel to interstate war, we have seen, and the ANC at the time agreed, and Algeria at the time agreed, but there is that moment in history that we keep forgetting that the international order of things is also demanding the modeling of anti-colonial revolution on the logic of anti, onto the logic of interstate war. And the international order of things, I mean, national liberations also contributed to that because they're the ones who demanded that, that demanded that. So now we live in a play and they demanded that because otherwise they would be criminalized. They demanded that not because Otherwise, the soldiers will be criminals and not prisoners of war. That's why they're demanding that. But so that we live in a world that demands the modeling of non-state action, anti-colonial action onto state military action. And then we go and condemn <laughs> the non-state military action when the entire international legal order of things is one that privileges the state. And if you want to compete, you must then model your action onto the model of the state. So, and that's why another reason why I think we need to really take a step back and think critically about international law and the kind of political horizons it charts for us. Sorry, that was a long answer. I'd like to pick up on that. Um... I, um, uh, Oslo is much in the news now and there's a documentary and I was thinking about that a lot and in terms of um, one of the items that uh, on the agenda was to remove uh, Zionism as a form of racism from the international covenant on um, uh, against uh, racial discrimination and apartheid in which Zionism was uh, identified as a form of racism. Um, by the way, in that <clears throat> covenant, indigenous peoples were also included and that uh, was the entry uh, we did, uh, we, we made in 1977 <clears throat> based on that treaty. But when it, um, uh, it was a 1973 treaty the United States and Israel boycotted <clears throat> every single conference uh, held, uh, conference on racism, the one in <clears throat> uh, 78, the one in 1983. Uh, and they kind of gave up on having those conferences. They were very important conferences. I went to all of them. Um, and uh, Oslo then, you know, took it out and took the guts out of that um, out of that treaty um, and um, that uh, identification of Zionism as racism was um, uh, not there when they formed the Clinton uh, gave support to um, the, and then it was under Bush that actually it took place, the conference in Durban the a revival of the convention, and it was a huge conference um, for the first time, uh, the United States was going to not boycott it. But you know what? They boycotted it anyway. They came, they looked, they saw uh, the non-governmental, those of us in the non-governmental um, um, conference that we organized uh, right before the, the um, official conference, we had no restrictions on what we called anything. So it's always more radical. And then we try to push this <clears throat> on the delegates and they can refuse uh, and usually do. Uh, so it's a, you know, it's a bunch of us activists doing this. And 
based on that, because we wanted, we called for the reinstitution of Zionism as a form of racism into the covenant. And the US used that, the NGO document, as an excuse to boycott. So Israel and the United States walked out. The real reason was that the African National Congress government invited Yasser Arafat to speak. And um, also Nelson Mandela was president and invited Yasser Arafat to speak. And they both spoke and they both spoke together and they spoke at our conference as well, the NGO conference. So the, you know, the, the um, bad faith of the United States in dealing with racism, we were always at, you know, the only people from the United States who were participating, you know, in this whole process were the in, were Native Americans. And we could not get other organizations. People in the United States think the United, United Nations is, uh, is um, irrelevant. It's controlled by the US government and um, therefore totally irrelevant. And you know they only know about the Security Council and they don't know that law is made by the General Assembly, not Security Council. So they don't participate in it. So I think I see that attitude quite a bit among young uh, Palestinian Americans, um, this negation of the UN work. And I think that's one um, problem, you know, that, that uh, could be discussed in this country is, you know, I don't, I think it comes out of ignorance of the process um, and also of the, the importance of international law. And uh, the U.S. would love for everyone to keep thinking it's irrelevant uh, because we're not using, a, you know, the most powerful tool that we have access to uh, to explain things and to, like Samira just has, and and to um, and to actually act upon it. May I just? Uh, yeah, please. Add a few words to it. Uh, one of the issues that I'm concerned about in the book um, is, is how do we think extreme violence? Do we think it as criminal or as political? And my argument is that we cannot think it as criminal for just one reason. Crime is against the state. By definition, the state cannot commit crime. The Nazi state could not commit crime. The apartheid state could not commit crime. I want us to shift our language from crime to politics. Now, armed struggle is not the opposite of politics. Armed struggle has its own politics. And we need to acknowledge the politics of armed struggle. We need to acknowledge it, whether it's emancipatory or whether it's terrorist. What is it? This situation we are talking about, the 11 days, missiles versus rockets, okay? It didn't begin with missiles and rockets. It started in East Jerusalem. It started with ethnic cleansing in East Jerusalem. And then it went on to Al-Aqsa Mosque. And then we came down to missiles and rockets. But the amazing thing is that it has generated an astonishingly new politics. It has, I think, as Samir was, 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 was telling us, um, it has... It, it has begun a momentum which seeks to reverse the fragmentation of the Palestinian population. And the more that fragmentation is reversed, the more the center of gravity shifts from Gaza to the occupied territories and to inside Israel and to Palestinian communities on the boundaries of Israel, the more politics becomes the center of focus. Now, today, 
I mean, this, this question of whether Zionism is racist or not, I mean, Bernie Sanders says Israel is a racist state, right? He wouldn't have been willing to say that before the 11 days. I don't think so. Right? No. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong and I'm happy to be wrong. But, but I'm just saying that, that there's, been a, there's been a shift, kind of a shift on the ground. It's discernible. Um, so why do we want to ignore the larger picture? And why do we want to focus on just one kind of violence, which is the non-state violence, in a situation where the violence is so asymmetrical that you of young kids on the front page. They didn't put photographs of missiles of young kids on the front page and said, why? Why? I mean, I saw it only this morning. I'm in Kampala, right? Kampala is a faraway place. Um, so, but, but I think, I, I mean, I just think that uh, there, there is something myopic if we are going to reduce this what we have witnessed over the last two weeks into one issue, Hamas. That's absurd. Thank you, Mahmoud. I just wanna add one sentence here to what you just said to amplify it, one sentence. Uh, we recently published a blog piece by a, a Palestinian activist from Haifa on our journal's blog. And he says in that blog piece, and it's a sentence that he's telling, and he's describing going to a protest right in Haifa, where the police will come and attack them and the settlers will come and attack them. And what does he say? And it just goes to your point. It is my small contribution to perhaps distract Israel from Gaza to us so that they actually come and police us, spend some of their forces, send some of their forces to police us instead of bombarding Gaza. And you know, as naive as some of our listeners may think, that statement is, it actually illuminates the logic of, well, by participating, we also release Gaza from some of the burden it has come to carry and to condense really. Um, and uh, by, by, by showing then the continuity of political struggle on so many different fronts and each from their own location and with their own capacities. So just to amplify what you were saying. We have uh, Philip Wallstetter uh, back showing his face with us. Oh, we got to leave. Okay, we got five more minutes, I think. So quick question and quick answers is what I'm told from um, uh, Central Command of, of Red May. You're, you're, you're muted, Philip. So I don't have know if we have time to get into the question about the unusually perverse relationship uh, between American politics and Israel inside America and how that uh, will play out in the future. As a Jewish American anti-Zionist, I'm of course very interested in that, but uh, I think we have to, uh, we have, that's such a, a large topic uh, that to even open it up to a response would, uh, so maybe that's another uh, that's another panel to be held by Red May in the future. I want to thank everybody for being involved in this discussion, Samira, Mahmoud, and Roxanne, and Ted, a discussion which can obviously and should obviously uh, uh, in, a, in an uh, under-discussed area in the United States where there are so many restrictions on speech of Palestinians and about Palestinians, I remember it was only 1986 before a Palestinian was allowed to be on TV. Hanan Ashrawi and Saib Erekat and two other Palestinians were finally allowed on national TV to give a Palestinian side as four Israelis were allowed to. Unfortunately, the, as we all know, the efforts to curb uh, speech about Palestine and even criminalize it uh, in some states now and criminalized people who support BDS uh, is uh, afoot in many Republican states and, and need, that needs to be discussed. But uh, alas, we are out of time. So uh, I wanna thank you all again uh, 
for a discussion that I will watch uh, carefully again to pick up some of the points uh, that are worth thinking over and over again. And I do want to uh, mention to people who are watching uh, that we have uh, two more great events tomorrow at 11 a.m. We have Rethinking the Cultural Revolution, Chinese Cultural Revolution with Alexander Russo, Asad Hader, uh, and uh, uh, Chris Connery and uh, Andrea Piazzaroli Longabardi. And then at 5 p.m. we have, oh, or is it 6 p.m.? Hold on, I better take a look at this. Uh, oh God, for some reason <laughs> my iPhone simply won't move when I need it to. Yes, okay, 5 p.m. Michael Hart, Kathy Weeks, and Veronica Gargo, Feminist International, How to Change Everything. And Monday, Marks for Cats, uh, to see Lee Claire uh, LaBerge and her cats talk Marks. It's an experience you won't want to miss. Check it out on the web. Uh, thanks, everybody. Go donate at www.redmayseattle.org. And everyone have a great day.